I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Benjamin Penny. I'm the director of the Australian Center on China and the World. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. It's um, a very great pleasure to be introducing this lecture today um, for two reasons. Um, first, when our centre was set up about five years ago, one of the rationales for doing so was to deepen and add complexity to um, the general understanding of China amongst members of the general public, journalists, policymakers, and others. Um, we've often noted, those of us who've been involved with Chinese studies over time, that the level of discussion is usually fairly shallow. Um, uh, people have a nodding acquaintance and they do rather a lot with not so much. One of the questions, of course, that comes up in normal conversations with people about China in the last few years has had to do with cybersecurity. It is, in fact, I think a classic case of where general perceptions of China and cybersecurity um, have been not very well informed. And for that reason, I think this lecture today is um, absolutely fulfilling our role uh, to add complexity, to deepen understanding of what is a really most important topic and one which, generally speaking, is not well understood. The second reason it gives me great pleasure to introduce this lecture today is that it's the first time that the Australian Centre on China and the World and the National Security College here at the ANU have actually formally cooperated in a major event. Um, the NSC and CIW, as we are known, acronymically, as the ANU is so fond, um, uh, ANU, uh, CIW and NSC are in fact kind of twins. Um, we were born at the same time through the largesse of the Commonwealth Government, and for the last few years we've looked at each other across the campus and acknowledged and admired the work of the other, but until now we've not really um, forged the kind of relationship that I think both sides uh, have always intended to forge and um, want, to, want to put some flesh on that bone. So um, I'm really pleased that this is the first of, I hope, many occasions that we can cooperate, not only in these kind of public occasions, which are wonderful, but also in um, other aspects of uh, activities based at the university. So personal thanks to Rory for um, initiating this, which I think is a, a really a potentially very strong cooperation. Uh, so to today's lecture. Um, John R. Lindsay uh, is a remarkable person um, with degrees from Stanford and MIT, with uh, your actual military experience in the Navy, and as you can see now, comes to us from the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. He's an assistant professor of digital media and global affairs. He has published in, I think I'm not a professional in this field, but it looks to me like most of the major journals in which one would want to publish if one was involved in this field. He's the co-editor of China and Cybersecurity, Espionage, Strategy and Politics in the Digital Domain, which is Oxford University Press from last year. And he's completing a book, Shifting the Fog of War, Information Technology and the Politics of Control. Um, I think this will be a fascinating lecture, a stimulating lecture, and uh, I think John is the ideal person to tell us about the topic, the role of cybersecurity in Chinese foreign policy. I'll invite him to the lectern and um, say that after his lecture, we will be doing questions and answers for a while. So, John, thanks for being Thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin Penny, for this opportunity. Thank you, Rory Metcalf, for bringing these two schools together. And I also want to thank Roger Bradbury for putting together uh, what has been an absolutely stimulating set of discussions on cybersecurity and policy uh, and, and ways forward to, to study this.
So uh, my interest and China's interest in cybersecurity uh, started at about the same time, although I didn't know it at the time. I was a very junior naval officer working at the NATO headquarters in Italy. And, uh, and I became very interested in this fact that here we were fighting a war, there were no boots on the ground, and everything we did was mediated by information technology. So it started many years of interest in the role of information technology and its effect on military power. Well, during that same conflict, we accidentally blew up the Chinese embassy. And the next day, Jiang Zemin called a meeting of the Central Military Commission, and they made a few decisions right then. They decided they needed to start investing in technologies that would allow China to see far, strike far, and strike fast. They decided that they needed to start developing exactly the things that the enemy was afraid of. And so were put in place a number of initiatives to develop space weapons, cyber warfare, as well as some of the ballistic missiles that we now have seen fielded uh, in the last couple of years. So uh, as my interest in uh, battlefield networks continued to develop, uh, China's activity uh, in the cyber domain also continued to develop. And so uh, if you are interested in network-centric warfare or the revolution of military affairs, it became impossible to ignore China. China became a central case for understanding uh, the larger effect of technology uh, on, on security. So I will say that uh, I come to China a bit late. I've learned a great deal from people, including people in this room. Uh, and my C++ is probably a bit better than my Putanghua. But this is a complex domain. And uh, I think that that kind of interdisciplinary collaboration tends to be critical. So my, my strategy has been to lean on a lot of people that know a lot of different aspects of this particular problem. So this isn't just a uh, blatant advertisement for the book that was just mentioned. Um, I also wanted to point out a couple of things. First of all, I want to talk about uh, the cover of this book. What you're actually looking at are a pair of ghosted images. Both of them were taken at the Wujun World Internet Conference uh, last year, 2014, November. And this is a picture of the exhibition hall where you have several Chinese corporations, internet corporations, mobile phone corporations, and then of course there are two policemen that are wandering around. And this really captures two aspects which I think are central to understanding China's experience with the internet. China wants the economically open internet to get rich, but China wants to make sure that they have political control of that openness. They want to unbundle the political and the economic dimensions of this liberal socio-technical institution. Now, this also is taking place at Wujun, which is sometimes described as the Venice of China. It's a lovely town with canals all over the place, but it has also been utterly emptied out. And for this particular event, there were uh, no residents, and there was just, uh, it was populated with uh, people that were acting as if they lived there and acting as if they were selling things. And the place was entirely clean and bright. So this is yet another metaphor for this idea that China is taking the internet and reconstructing it in a more sanitized and uh, attractive version. So when we think about China and cybersecurity, this really is the view from the West. And of course, we're looking at an FBI wanted poster that came out uh, in May 2014, shortly after the US uh, Department of Justice indicted these five individuals, allegedly members of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Important to point out that this was an indictment of individuals, not an indictment of the organization, not even a direct tie explicitly to the Chinese state. Uh, it wasn't until the North Korean hack of Sony that the US actually made a tie between the explicit nation state uh, and hacking activity. But nevertheless, these five were brought together. And this Department of Justice indictment focused on economic espionage uh, uh, against a, a number of countries, uh, companies, excuse me. Now, interestingly, these same five individuals and the uh, organization in Shanghai that they are associated with uh, were first exposed a year before in a report by a private company named Mandiant. Now, Mandiant talked a little bit about, in fact, a lot about uh, commercial espionage, but also talked a great deal about espionage against military and government uh, uh, targets. Now, when the US opened this indictment, there was no mention of military and government espionage. The US has tried to make a very bright line distinction between commercial espionage for commercial profits, sponsored by the state in order to help uh, um, corporations in that country, which the US sees as unacceptable, and espionage more broadly. Uh, why might the US want to do that? Uh, 
Well, the answer is now obvious, thanks to uh, Mr. Snowden. Uh, Mr. Snowden revealed that uh, the Chinese, that the, that the cybersecurity problems across the Pacific really go in both ways. And in fact, for all the volume of Chinese activity uh, against Western interests, um, the sophistication of activity uh, from coming from the United States against Chinese targets of all kind uh, is of a whole different order. Now, this was a very difficult moment for China. Um, here is Edward Snowden, who is blowing all of these, these uh, American operations. In a sense, there's a, a sense of schadenfreude that uh, here is America that has been accusing China of, uh, of, of raiding the world's networks. Um, and yet, now here's the US doing the same thing. Uh, China often describes the situation as a thief crying, stop thief. Uh, and yet, at the same time, here's a dissident in Hong Kong, note the traditional characters. Um, here is China harboring the dissident who is fleeing another government whose uh, rules it is broken. And of course, this is happening also during uh, Xi Jinping's coming out party, right? He's supposed to be getting together with Barack Obama and Sunny Lands during the same time, uh, sort of stealing the national media spotlight. So this is kind of a very difficult uh, you know, set of, of, of circumstances for China to work through and deal with. Now, Cybersecurity involves a lot of technology, but the technology is put to political and economic work. And the kinds of political and economic tasks that states use that technology for can often result in very different kinds of operations and even very different uh, technological characteristics. So what we're looking at here is a tale of two advanced persistent threats. That word advanced persistent threat is a word that uh, had traditionally been used to describe uh, only China, but I think it's only fair to describe the National Security Agency as an advanced persistent threat as well. We're looking at two operations, both of them disclosed in uh, early 2015. Uh, the green one over here on the right, uh, disclosed by the private cybersecurity firm of Kaspersky in Moscow, uh, which specializes in publicizing American operations. And the other one, we're looking at a, um, an operation described by uh, the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto. So in this other one called Equation Group, which is almost certainly the National Security Agency based on a lot of artifacts that relate to uh, other attacks that you may have heard of, including the Stuxnet operation against Iran, Flame, Gauss, and a number of other things. Uh, there's a lot of, of code that is shared here. And when you look at these different modules, they do some very interesting things. They look for very precise, precise configurations very precise targeting to make sure that they're looking at the right machine on the right network. If they don't find it, they delete themselves. Uh, there are modules, especially um, the one called Greyfish there at the bottom, which is designed to maintain an incredible degree of persistence. It actually overwrites the firmware to withstand military grade erasure of, uh, of, of the disks. This is something that Computer scientists sort of laughed at, didn't think it was possible. Suddenly, Kaspersky shows that not only is it possible, it is being uh, exploited quite rigorously. This is an actor that is very interested in stealth, in precision, and persistence. It also happens to have been found in states like Russia, Iran, Pakistan, and another other, uh, a number of other countries that would be of peculiar interest to that particular actor. Now, compare this to what's been described as the Great Cannon. You're all probably familiar with the Great Firewall. Uh, the Great Firewall sits between the global internet and its connections to China. It's actually described as a man on the side attack. Uh, the Great Firewall uh, basically listens, it taps all of that information going back and forth. If dirty words that are on the official banned list uh, come by, then the Great Firewall will send a reset command to the server, so it will stop serving content uh, into China. So what happened is um, in, uh, in late 2014, an organization called greatfire.org, and they supply a lot of uh, software that dissidents can use to circumvent the Great Firewall, found itself under tremendous denial of service attack, one of the biggest DDoS attacks that had ever been seen. It was being attacked by uh, billions of computers uh, an hour. A lot of that infrastructure actually residing on um, uh, GitHub machines located in the United States. How did this work? Well, it actually used the same architecture as the Great Firewall, but rather than being a man in the middle, it was a man, excuse me, a man on the side, it was a man in the middle. And if you were uh, outside of China and you were making requests to a Baidu server, 
Now, you might not know that you're making a request to a Baidu server. Perhaps you're visiting a Taiwanese server, but there is an advertisement that's being served up from China. Uh, China was serving up these little JavaScript uh, pieces back to your computer, and that essentially uh, created a giant botnet that allowed all of these unwitting computers then to be enrolled in this distributed denial of service attack. In a sense, a weaponization of the internet. This is noisy, this is loud, and this is focusing on suppressing politically subversive activity in the eyes of the Chinese state. Quite the opposite of what we're looking at uh, on the American side. So uh, when we're talking about cybersecurity, we're talking about a lot of different things and focusing on the political and economic intentions uh, of those attacks is, is, is really critical for, for looking at that activity. So let's transition a little bit to talking about China's uh, overall approach to the internet. Uh, Chinese internet development started uh, a little bit later in the mid-aught years, uh, but really started to take off quite quickly. 2015 numbers um, put Chinese netizens or Chinese internet users at about 640 million. Uh, still only half of the population, so China's uh, 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 internet penetration is not as significant as what we see in countries like Australia, the United States, Japan, and Europe, upwards of about 90% uh, uh, or higher. Um, kind of that, that you know, China's full of paradoxes. Here we have you know, both development and developing country uh, overlap together. But China is very interested in trying to do these two things that I set out at the beginning. They want to use the internet to get rich and take advantage of all of the opportunities that being connected to the world offers, and yet at the same time, uh, try and control the political liabilities that would come with uh, man maintaining that openness as well. So uh, China recognizes quite explicitly that the internet is an engine of growth. Uh, Xi Jinping has talked about it as two wheels on an engine, two wings of a bird. Uh, development must go together with security. Um, uh, China's economic miracle has been largely based on uh, exploiting um, uh, 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 opportunities in the supply chain and in low and medium end production, um, where they have been able to achieve massive economies of scale, which means they're utterly dependent on um, the integrated global economy, which of course in turn is utterly dependent on the internet. Now at the same time, China talks about uh, needing to uh, uh, ensure the rational and positive use of the internet by curbing um, any malicious uses. Now, uh, um, in a 2010 document on uh, the internet in China by the State Council, they talked about several things which were not quite acceptable. No organization or individual may procure, duplicate, announce, or disseminate information having the following contents. Being against the cardinal principles set forth in the Constitution, endangering state security, divulging state secrets, Fair enough, subverting state power and jeopardizing national unification, damaging state honor and interest, instigating ethnic hatred or discrimination, jeopardizing ethnic unity, jeopardizing state religious policy, disrupting social order and stability, disseminating obscenity, pornography, gambling, violence, brutality, terror, abetting crime, humiliating or slandering others, trespassing on the lawful rights and interests of others, and other contents forbidden by laws and administrative regulations. So I'm sure most people in this room have already broken at least three of these laws uh, before breakfast. So what we see is uh, a lot of law that enables a fairly arbitrary uh, uh, enforcement of those as the situation may uh, allow. Now you're probably wondering who this little creature is uh, at the bottom. This is the grass mud horse. I'm not going to try and say its name in Chinese because if I do and I get the tones wrong, I'm going to insert, in, insult several of your, uh, your parentage and your relatives. I wouldn't want to do that. But this character shows up as becoming a bit of a folk, a folk hero for the evasion of censorship uh, techniques. China has one of the most uh, sophisticated information control regimes in the world. It involves uh, filtering, dirty word blocking, uh, and it also involves more active uh, measures to uh, shut down sites and change and guide content. Uh, but of course, there's a constant arms race between those efforts to stop that discussion and playful attempts to try and work around so-called harmonization uh, of the internet. And this creature is uh, one advocate for that. The goal at the end is to make cyberspace clean and chipper. Now this is a bit of an eye chart. I'm just going to call a, a few things ahead, uh, to, to your attention. Um, 
That's China's overall policy. How does China put it together? I think of China as an authoritarian system. Uh, many scholars describe it actually as a fragmented authoritarianism. It's a big country. It's growing quickly. Uh, it's a very, very difficult place to manage. And when you ask Chinese information security professionals um, who manages cybersecurity in China, they'll sort of laugh at you and they'll say, Gong Bao Ji Di, right? Kung Pao Chicken. Now, you guys have probably enjoyed this at a Chinese restaurant. It's all chopped up mixed together, kind of spicy, lots of nuts. Uh, that is a pun on the first character, if you were to talk about the Ministry of Public Security, State Secrecy Bureau, the, uh, the Party uh, Encryption Bureau, and of course the PLA Bing Ding. Right? So uh, here we have your, your Kung Pao chicken, uh, everybody managing a slightly different part. Now, uh, as elsewhere in the Chinese government, everything's broken into these three big silos. Uh, the PLA, of course, is the party's army, not the state army. The, uh, the Chinese Communist Party policy-making organs, and then the executive uh, implementing uh, organs over on the state council side. Now, uh, you'll notice in the middle that you have uh, a couple of these leading small groups, which is the party's uh, mechanism for different uh, policy uh, issues. Um, were collapsed in early 2014 and elevated to the presidential level to create this new cybersecurity and informatization uh, leading small group. Before that, it was a much lower level state informatization group and that was looking at overall Chinese information technology policy and a subgroup within that focused on security and cryptography. And they released a lot of uh, documents in 2003, started releasing money, uh, but then got distracted by other things, the Olympics, the financial crash, uh, and meanwhile, uh, indigenous cybersecurity industry started to grow up and develop a lot of its uh, own interests. Now, that SILG, the original state inform informatization leading group, actually fell under the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology. Very technocratic bureau that manages uh, the internet service providers um, and a lot of kind of the technical infrastructure of the internet. When these were elevated and, and turned into this new SILG, the Cybersecurity Informatization Group with the heads of all of the relevant agencies, the administrative organ was taken out of MIIT and put underneath the State Internet Information Office. Okay? And this falls beneath, of course, the State Council Information Office, which manages propaganda, information control. And this was a very clear message in my mind that we're really going to emphasize the information control aspects when we're talking about cybersecurity uh, to the extent that that management has been taken away from the technocrats and given to the propaganda ministries. Um, the State Internet Information Office has since been renamed the Cyberspace Administration of China that uh, is being run by a guy named Liu Wei who doesn't have much of a technical background but did run Xinhua. So again, when Chinese are talking about cybersecurity, they're not necessarily talking about the same uh, technical things that we are in the US, in the Western world. What's the result? Well, one result, I would argue, is that information security, is not the same as network security, is what we talk about as cybersecurity in the West, where we're talking about uh, a reliable and technically robust and resilient internet. Information security is a much broader concept, which includes, in fact, emphasizes the content of, uh, of, of that activity. As a result, you have an open season on, Chinese, uh, on the Chinese internet for cybercrime. In fact, you see levels of cybercrime that would not be tolerated in the West as long as they are only focused on economically exploitative activity. Uh, it's very interesting to look at the differences between the, Euro the Eastern European cybercrime, which targets Western Europe and the United States. Uh, this is an export activity. It does not prey at home. Eastern European cybercriminals do not prey on Eastern European victims. China, by contrast, is largely a homegrown uh, activity. This is Chinese criminals preying on uh, Chinese uh, victims as well as participating in the larger global cybercrime cyber crime, uh, ecology. Um, this is enforced only sporadically. There'll usually be a large roundup like there was uh, last July. 15,000 people will be arrested, some of them more for more political reasons than uh, actual hacking. And in the meantime, a lot of the buying and selling of stolen credentials, envelopes, video game accounts, and other digital goods uh, happen right virtually out in the open. And if you know the jargon, then you can go ahead and track uh, what this looks like. And we have a couple of authors from uh, Tsinghua who did exactly that. 
This is a Jingjing and Cha Cha down at the bottom. Uh, uh, it was a little icon, it used to be in the Shenzhen internet, which would pop up if you were doing dirty word searches, and they would remind you to keep the internet safe. Uh, so again, focusing on Xinqi Anshuan, not Wang Lil Anshuan. Let's look at another dimension of Chinese activity, the dimension of Chinese activity that, of course, gets the most press in the West. Uh, we're looking at not a Snowden document, but yet another uh, leaked document to, that was leaked to a, uh, an American news agency, uh, which is a classified picture of the NSA's tracking of targets, both commercial and government, within the United States that have been hit by Chinese advanced persistent threat uh, actors. And as you can see, it's kind of an epidemic. The United States looks like it has measles. Uh, there are only two kinds of organizations. Those have been hacked by the Chinese and those that haven't discovered that just yet. <laughs> China often denies that this is going on. How do we know that it's China? Uh, attribution is a big complex problem. It's often described as one of the hard problems of cybersecurity. I'll just give you one taste of why uh, 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 the little bits of of evidence come together and point pretty unambiguously at China. Uh, first of all, a pretty strong motive. There's a, you know, a lot of targets that would be the kinds of targets that China would be interested in, focusing on the, the industries which have been targeted for growth, uh, focusing on some of the civil society dissident targets we talked about, and focusing on government military targets. We're looking here at a, uh, a non-governmental organization in Washington, D.C. that deals with a lot of China issues, and we're looking at phishing emails that come in, and this is Eastern U.S. time, exactly 12 hours off of China. And so what you're looking at is in the morning, there's a big spike, it kind of drops off, there's lunchtime, goes back up after lunch, then the swing shift comes in in the evening, and then it drops off uh, throughout the, the, the evening in China, in China standard time. Uh, this is very regularized, bureaucratic, workaday activity happening on weekdays, happening in the morning, lunch break, going back again. Uh, this is uh, a large, robust, industrial-scale uh, fishing activity. You put that together with artifacts that show up in code, um, linguistic characteristics uh, and some other technical indicators, you start to put together a pretty interesting and persuasive case that doesn't have a, a reasonable uh, alternative explanation that this is a Chinese penetration. Uh, this is another bit of an eye chart, but I only want you to look at the shape of this particular curve. This is a list of open source uh, uh, APT penetrations that have been attributed with some confidence to uh, China. Um, some of them by government organizations, uh, most of them, however, by private cybersecurity firms. Starting in about uh, 2004 and going to about mid-2003, I'm currently working on uh, bringing this a little more up to date. And it's looking at uh, targets that are exclusively government, exclusively commercial, and those that involve uh, mixed targeting. And they're sorted in the order in which they were reported, uh, and then the, the uh, long bar goes back to the earliest known uh, penetration that was reported there. Uh, this data is very, very noisy, very unreliable. It's hard to track uh, activity of any kind when it happens to be self-hiding, right? No intelligence organization wants to reveal what their activity actually is. So we're seeing what is visible, and we're seeing what uh, Western media and cybersecurity firms are willing to uh, report. But there's some robustness check on this in that individual APT actors, like APT1 that we talked about a little bit with uh, the Shanghai-based organization at the beginning, um, actually follow a very similar pattern. Focusing first on government targets, but then broadening the aperture to include more and more commercial targeting. Um, really see a steepening of reporting, which is both more of a Western interest and awareness in this activity, um, but also a higher level of Chinese activity. But interestingly, you also start to see more and more uh, long-term penetrations and more and more sophisticated penetrations rooted out as we go on. Uh, this is interesting and is tentative, I will say very tentative evidence that we are actually getting better at identifying and uh, 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 deflecting and penetrating and, and dealing with some of these uh, penetrations. Um, I think it's quite possible that we will look back on 2011 and 2012 as the happy time in Chinese cyber exploitation. Of course, is a reference to 1941 when uh, German U-boats plow plowed the sea in the Battle of the Atlantic and they sunk convoys with wild abandon. And it was only once the Allies 
cracked Enigma, figured out how to do anti-submarine warfare, started convoying up. In other words, put their counterintelligence and defensive procedures into place that the balance turned decisively against the Germans. And we're starting to see that as well as governments as well as, and firms start to really up their counterintelligence game and make this a less permissive environment for Chinese threat operators. So we see a tremendous amount of activity, and people like former NSA Director General Keith Alexander have described this activity as the greatest movement, greatest transfer of wealth in history. Uh, others have described it as this tidal wave of wealth moving from west to east. Uh, and certainly we do see a great deal of activity. But does activity translate into productivity for China? Does it translate into competitive advantage? And I would argue that China faces a number of serious obstacles in taking that illicitly gained information and translating that into something it can use. You can think of this in terms of a number of transaction costs that stand between the acquisition of information and the application in the competitive international environment. First of all, if you're bringing in terabytes of information, you need to find that needle in a haystack. This is an intelligence problem. Then you need to make sure that you get that valuable information to somebody in the government or an industry that can actually use that information. They need to be able to apply it. Maybe they need to retrofit their industrial production lines. Maybe they need to change some policy. And that policy has to have an effect back out in, the, uh, uh, in commercial or military or political competition. This is a very non-trivial set of steps that need to go through. Um, and the collection of that information, which is the only thing that we see, especially when we only focus on the technical dimension, um, that is only the very first step. Now, there are certainly uh, uh, cases, individual cases, where you can look at um, products that have been uh, reverse engineered and brought to market. Um, you can look at uh, deals which have fallen through because the Chinese knew the negotiating position of the other kind. So I don't want to say that there isn't anything to be gained here. I'm saying that we need to be a little bit uh, skeptical. Now, again, we have, how do you test any proposition like this? We have the same problem that we're talking about a self-hiding phenomenon, right? China will not admit that it is engaged in industrial espionage, so you certainly have a difficult time seeing how that is working. Well, what we can look is uh, maybe for something that's kind of an analog, okay? So let's look at cases where China is bringing open source science and technology data uh, from lots of different sources, from uh, scientific conferences, from industry shows, from journals. Um, China has invested a great amount of effort in setting up uh, a network of open source analysis centers to do exactly that, that, the, those processes that I'm looking at. And this is looking at just open source information. This is not talking about uh, ill-gotten information as well. Now, uh, China, like any good government bureaucracy, likes to report its activity. And here it's reporting uh, uh, two different kinds of numbers. One, the expenditures of money for acquiring foreign technology information. And second, the expenditures for actually absorbing. And there's a very systematic uh, process that different Chinese industries have described for, uh, for creating indigenous information, for bringing this over, understanding, reverse engineering, uh, disseminating it, re-innovating it. Uh, and so they track this information. And what's very interesting is as we move across the yacht years into 2011, we go from most of the money being spent on getting information from outside of China to an increasing percentage of that money being spent on making sense and absorbing and applying that information. So you can think about this as China goes up the value chain, it becomes more difficult to understand and deal with and incorporate um, uh, that information that, that you're getting from whatever source. And this is a fairly robust finding for scholars of innovation uh, who really focus on the soft or non-technical complements that must be in place in order to innovate. The institutions, the legal systems, the venture capital, uh, the recreational opportunities, the things that make Silicon Valley tick and are very difficult to duplicate even within the United States. Okay, so the bottom line here is China can steal text, but it has a hard time stealing the context, which is actually needed to maintain an innovative advantage. So let's move from industrial espionage, which second to cybercrime would be uh, the most actual activity that we see, and let's move to um, what is uh, less 
probable, but in many ways more worrisome and certainly something that captures a lot of media headlines on both sides of the Pacific. Um, what you're looking at here is a screenshot from a Chinese documentary called The Cyber Storm Has Arrived. It's on CCT7. If you guys are in China, I recommend you watch. This is the PLA's channel. There's always exciting things uh, being run on this particular station. And this was a documentary uh, in 2011 which talked about uh, cyber war and things that uh, you know, the U.S. was doing, China was doing, the future of war is going to be in cyberspace. But in this military production, there was this really weird moment where this picture came up, and here's the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and there's their Falun Gong organization being targeted by this very silly uh, graphical interface that says attack or cancel, right? So, there, there were, this is not an actual piece of technology clearly produced for propaganda, but isn't it interesting that even in a piece that is designed to talk about military interactions, we have a focus on information control. We have a focus on domestic security exported into the international internet. So looking a little more seriously at PLA uh, doctrine, uh, there are a, a consistent number of themes which uh, have emerged um, throughout uh, the past several, of year, several years. And what you're looking at here are a couple of quotes that I've pulled from the 2013 update of the science of military strategy. The Chinese kind of have this Soviet system of doing scientific strategy where it goes through several committees and then it's released in these uh, various documents. This is the large overview capstone document. And the 2013 version was interesting because it put uh, incredible emphasis with respect to the previous edition on uh, cyberspace, space, uh, the naval domain, uh, and thinking about deterrence, how to pull all of these together. And here you see a couple of discussions of the central place that uh, information warfare is going to play in that concept of operations. This was echoed in the 2015 military strategy, which Beijing released, in which a document says that the world revolution in military affairs is continuing, Space and cyberspace have become the new high grounds of conflict. It is in the information domain that wars will be fought and lost uh, or won. And you see a couple of themes that emerge again and again. This is an asymmetric form of uh, interaction, one of the most effective means for a weak military to fight a strong one, right? A way to try and deal with, Amer with American military strengths by looking for the weak underbelly, which in this case would be command and control and logistics systems that the U.S. depends upon in order to maintain its Pacific fleet far forward. Uh, you need to have that, that digital tether uh, 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 running that. So this is an attractive asymmetric target. It's discussed as a long-range way of interacting. It may be hard for China to get military force around the world, but it can do it instantaneously through cyberspace. It's potent. The United States is so dependent upon information technology that it's a way to paralyze, but only if you move first. And this idea of moving first comes up again and again and again. There's this strong idea that you need to paralyze the other side's networks before your side is paralyzed. There's sort of this cult of the offense in the cyber domain that is very built into the way that the PLA uh, talks about this. And then there's this very interesting quote down at the bottom, right? We need to try and get our way without winning, sort of this very Sun Tzu type concept. And we might do that by blending together civilian activity and military activity, uh, which is fairly meaningful in the cyber domain where you would use a lot of the same techniques for cyber espionage that you might use to infiltrate critical infrastructure. So how realistic is this? Now, first of all, I would caution you against thinking that, okay, that quote I just put up there is some interesting Chinese way of war. Uh, this is somehow Sun Tzu in the digital age. Uh, that's actually not the case. What we're looking at is a common meme that has been produced, reproduced, and rediscovered uh, by great power militaries uh, throughout the 20th century. So over on the far side, this gentleman is Schlieffen. Alfred Graf von Schlieffen, yes, that Schlieffen, Schlieffen of the Schlieffen plan, uh, not normally thought of as a theorist of information technology, but just a few years after he handed off the plan for European annihilation to Molke the Younger, he wrote this interesting essay called On the Future of War in 1908. And it's got this passage in there where he talks about in the future, the modern Alexander will sit back in his office at a in a comfortable chair and have the entire battlefield spread out on a map. 
and there will be dirigibles sitting above the battlefield that can see everything and will be transmitting their reports via telegraph and wireless so that he can calmly direct the battle, which will then be quite decisive uh, and advantageous. The Shalifan plan, of course, didn't work out that way. Now we fast forward and we look at the Soviets, this is Marshal Nikolai Algarkov in the uh, mid-Cold War, looking out at uh, some, some newfangled technologies that the Americans are developing through DARPA, looking at the first generation of smart weapons, later brilliant weapons, uh, all kinds of, 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 of efforts that the Americans are pursuing to try and deal with the qualitative disadvantage that they face vis-a-vis -vis Warsaw Pact forces in Central Europe by creating all kinds of advanced technologies which will allow them to find, fix, and finish Warsaw Pact forces uh, deep in the heart of Europe. And so he starts writing about a military technical revolution. This will be as big as Blitzkrieg. Uh, information technology is substituting information for mass. Well, this fellow, Andrew Marshall, is reading a lot of this and says, that's interesting. The Soviets are afraid of this. We should double down and do any more of this, and starts writing about this, commissioning academic studies. And they start writing about the revolution of military affairs. The revolution of military affairs is going to be offense dominant, long range, potent, asymmetric, all of those things that the Chinese were talking about. And indeed, in books like uh, Unrestricted Warfare, written in the 90s by this guy, now Major General, um, uh, you see uh, a, an importation of ideas that start with the Soviets looking at the Americans, the Americans copying Soviet ideas, Chinese now writing about American ideas, and now we're looking at Americans back translating Chinese ideas and talking about a Chinese uh, way of war. Now, there is a consistent expectation that the revolution in military affairs will be fast, quick, and decisive, and yet it is constantly disappointed. Okay? Uh, we see that confusion and the fog of war continues to reign on the battlefield, and to the degree that it does work for U.S. and NATO forces that have tried to put it together, it works because you have this bottom-up innovation amongst junior officers, NCOs, and embedded civilians working in a very uh, decentralized manner. China is beginning to understand this, but recognizes that empowering its NCOs, empowering its JOs, is a very difficult thing for an army like the PLA and its institutional legacy as the party's army to really wrap its hands around. So the institutional component, just like in the uh, commercial case, looms large in actually translating that technological potential into military advantage. The fog of war is not just something that exists on the battlefield, it's something that afflicts uh, cyberspace as well. And what we're looking at here uh, is a screenshot from Iran before the Stuxnet attack, looking at its um, uh, industrial control system, uh, which of course was attacked by the Stuxnet virus put together allegedly by the U.S. government and with uh, help or maybe uh, with the, the, the major leadership of the Israelis. We don't quite understand that yet. But the point I want to make is that when we talk about military or uh, uh, disruptive cyber physical events, we're looking at an end of maybe four, maybe six, depending on how you count, very few, and it requires a, great, a high degree of sophistication. Mistakes are made on both sides, right? We're not supposed to know about Stuxnet. We know about Stuxnet because the coders, even though they were at the top of their game, it was the National Security Administration with all kinds of support, years and years of preparation, they mocked up an entire uh, copy of Natanz, broke things in the safety of the Negev Desert and back somewhere in, in the United States. Uh, they still made mistakes. Simple ones like they controlled for all of the antiviruses that people might use, ESET, Symantec, uh, Kaspersky, but they didn't control for this really strange one in Belarus, right? And that's one of the ones that actually compromised Stuxnet. So mistakes get made even when you're at the top of your game. So suddenly China now finds itself in this interesting situation. It's written a lot about information warfare, considering that it's an asymmetric capability, but the asymmetry is actually running in the opposite direction. China has very little experience fighting a network-centric war, going up against a very, very uh, experienced adversary. And even in that case, uh, mistakes are being made. So that's something to worry about, and we'll continue to develop this, even though the political conditions that would get us there are perhaps uh, quite remote. So let's come back down to Earth a little bit and talk about um, what some of the activity uh, looks like and what we might actually be able to do about it. Well, for those of you that have been following the news, you probably read back in September, there was a big meeting uh, between Barack Obama and Xi Jinping again, and one of the major topics was cybersecurity. And they came to a landmark deal, 
which in effect said, we agree that we will not use ICT, information communication technology, to target commercial entities by state-sponsored actors, and we will not take that information and give it to other commercial actors uh, for commercial gain. So is this a, a landmark deal? We're advancing cyber norms, um, kind of a, a, a new moment for peace and cooperation, uh, or are these guys just had a bit too much of whatever they're drinking there? <laughs> This, the wording of the same agreement, interestingly, was repeated at the G20 meeting in uh, Turkey a couple uh, months later. I just want to say this is fairly you know, landmark stuff. Uh, but the activity uh, emanating from China, and we can only uh, assume until we have another Snowden emanating from the United States as well, uh, did not diminish. Uh, interestingly, it appears that some of the noisiest PLA actors have actually toned down their activity. And in the MSS, the Ministry of State Security, which is like China's CIA, that activity has actually increased. And that's very interesting because MSS is widely recognized by companies that operate and have to deal with uh, uh, regulation in China. The most sophisticated technical operators live in the MSS. So what's happened? The incentives are not to end cyber espionage. The incentives are to up your game and don't get caught. If you're going to engage in it, make sure that it's more sophisticated. Okay, there's no mechanisms for enforcement here. This is merely a gentleman's agreement. Uh, cyber activity depends upon deception. We can expect that deception to uh, become more and more sophisticated and enduring. So that really brings us right back to where we began. We started off in Wujun. We're gonna end back here in Wujun. This is a picture of some of the canals and we've got a couple of Chinese fishermen and they will continue to ply the electronic canals and within China itself, they will continue to clean it up and try and make cyberspace clean and bright. Uh, the second Wujun Internet Conference was held uh, just this last year. Um, uh, I received an invitation. I was going to go. Uh, they wanted to review the script of my talk. I said that would be fine if I can review your attendance list. And I never heard from the <laughs> inviters again. Um, but. Uh, some very similar things happen, right? So um, the delegates, which this time included Xi Jinping, as well as foreign ministers from, uh, uh, from, from Russia, from Kyrgyzstan, from Kazakhstan, talked a lot about um, multilateral, that is state-to-state -state, uh, internet sovereignty, attempts to try and create new governments me uh, governance mechanisms, which would emphasize the sovereign control of states over their own uh, digital networks. In a sense saying, what happens within Chinese networks stays within Chinese networks, and everybody else should agree to uh, remain outside of it. And this is a direct challenge to the legacy system, which is described as the multi-stakeholder system, a loose network of uh, companies, civil society groups, academic scientists, as well as government rep representatives that have, in a collaborative, voluntary manner, uh, put together the protocols that have built the internet and from which China has uh, benefited tremendously. So uh, this is all fine and well, um, but should we really be uh, concerned about this? Um, I would put to you the proposition that China has benefited tremendously from the existing multi-stakeholder system and in many ways doesn't actually want to break the internet. The internet is too valuable. Indeed, it is essential to the continuing growth although slightly slow, of China's economy. Um, and that growth, of course, is essential to the legitimacy of the party. So China does not want to strangle the goose that is laying the golden eggs, right? It just wants to try and modify uh, uh, the way that it's organized. Now, can China credibly commit to a norm of internet sovereignty? I would also suggest that the answer is probably not. Again and again, we've seen China interested in going outside of its borders um, whether it's to tamp down activity uh, that dissidents are engaged in, whether it's to rifle through the files of reporters at the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, because they're concerned that they may be putting embarrassing pictures, uh, embarrassing stories of China out on the uh, open press, whether it's uh, China's continuing interest in trying to gain some kind of illicit commercial advantage, China has a difficult time credibly committing to living up to the norm of internet sovereignty, which it is advancing. And furthermore, as China continues to invest in the globalized economy, it is also becoming more and more of a stakeholder in exactly the system that it is uh, uh, criticizing. <laughs>
So just to sum up, I kind of uh, put, to put up for you uh, a couple of these inequalities up here to maybe help us make sense of cybersecurity in general and the case of China in particular. Uh, first is recognizing that the concept of cybersecurity does not mean the same thing to all countries. Information security in China emphasizes content as much as, if not more than, technical activity. And that myopic focus on political information control is not creating a secure internet. It not only allows economic criminals uh, to function, it is a target-rich environment for foreign intelligence exploitation as well. Second, espionage is not the same as advantage. We see a great deal of activity, but that's not the same as intelligence productivity. Not only are there the transaction costs that I talked about, uh, there's also an active adversary that is doing the same thing. China is also being penetrated. When China says that it is a victim of cyber, cyber espionage, China is not wrong. Now, uh, the US tries to make a bright line between uh, national security targeting and commercial targeting. Uh, in practice, that can be a little bit gray, right? Uh, you can target commercial firms that are involved in the defense industry, and you can certainly hand that over. Uh, you can target commercial firms because there might be an intelligence advantage to doing so. Um, Huawei has servers all over the world. You might want to penetrate that particular company if you wanted to have intelligence collection uh, in any other company that was using Huawei's equipment. Um, uh, you might want to, if you were the US government, you might want to collect information to aid a trade delegation which is not going to help a specific firm, but is going to help an entire industry. So there's a bit of a gray line here. Um, and to the degree that intelligence services are either defending or aiding the competitive position of another country, it's going to uh, 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 create a little bit more strategic complexity in that espionage uh, equation. Third, uh, doctrine is not the same as capability. China writes some very uh, aggressive military doctrine, but for the most part, uh, even though there's a large effort at reorganization going on right now, um, it is still largely aspirational. China has not put in place the institutions and does not yet have the experience to make that right. And lastly, even though there's a great deal of resentment in the existing governance institutions of the internet, China is far too invested in them to actually offer a credible alternative. So I think what we can expect is a great deal of friction, but not necessarily a degradation because of the activity we were seeing in cyberspace. I actually sum up by saying that the bad news about cybersecurity, which is all over the newspapers, may perversely be good news for international relations. Informatization is this uh, interesting word, xin qi hua, that the Chinese use uh, to talk about the uh, transformation of all dimensions of society by information technology. So business, society, uh, military affairs are all being informatized. And sort of this Marxist-Leninist idea that technology drives tactics and everything else. So in the same way that the Industrial Revolution changes the means of production, now the Information Revolution changes everything. And so China is then compelled to come up with national policies. But unlike everywhere else in the information revolution where there's more of a bottom-up flavor, this is a very kind of heavy top-down uh, national information technology policy. Okay. Yes, gentlemen of here in blue. Uh, uh, thanks for the great lecture. Uh, my question is, uh, the cyber attack on the Ukraine uh, power grid, mm -hmm. which happened in December 2017, does it add another dimension to uh, cyber security? Do you think the developed nations would now try delisting the essential services from the technology themselves? So that's a very uh, interesting, so what he's talking about there was uh, an incident which appears to have received some confirmation now that uh, an attack uh, originating from Russian sources uh, shut down the power grid in Ukraine in the middle of the winter, uh, powers offline for about six hours, and then uh, brought up. Um, so this is the first time that the electrical power system has been shut down by a malicious intentional act. Um, that certainly is a watershed in, in, term, in, in terms of kind of cyber attack being used for some of the things that we've all been most afraid of. Um, but uh, in my opinion, this has actually followed very much the same script of 
uh, tentative restraint that we've seen in other places, right? This is an action that happens uh, two and a half years into a conflict. It's preceded by a lot of probes, uh, and it's turned off and it's mitigated within six hours, okay? So um, uh, it, things could change in the future, but we're still seeing a great deal of restraint built into exploitation and disruption in the cyber domain. So uh, again, more of this to come, but you're looking at more complexity, not necessarily catastrophic danger. Uh, Tom Worthington from the Research School of Computer Science here. Um, you mentioned the Olympic Games along the way. In 2000, late 2000s, um, I was invited over to Beijing to help with designing their website, which was run by the People's Daily. Are there vulnerabilities in China's use of the internet that'll make them nervous? They gave me a tour of the data center and I thought, well, if I just change the front page of the People's Daily tomorrow to say Chinese government overthrown, you know, everyone would, would believe it. So are there vulnerabilities that the Chinese government has to address in the aspects of the internet, even to protect itself from their own um, factions within the government? Yeah, absolutely. I think this this decom discombobulation of uh, Chinese internet policy uh, creates all kinds of flaws that can be exploited. I mean, you mentioned Olympic Games. I wasn't sure if you were talking about Stuxnet or uh, the actual Olympic Games, but you know, of course, there was that famous image of the Windows blue screen, you know, broadcast up on the birdcage. Uh, so you know, these flaws can exist, and if they exist, they could probably be manufactured uh, remotely. Um, one thing that I think is very interesting, and you're starting to see some discussion of it in kind of you know U.S. government back channels and other kind of strategic uh, places, is looking at. Uh, Chinese information control is a counter value target. So in the lexicon of deterrence, you distinguish between counter force taking out somebody's capabilities and counter value shutting down something that the adversary cares about. So China has signaled quite obviously that they care a great deal about information technology and they've built this tremendous technical infrastructure to, uh, to facilitate that. Well, a great firewall is a piece of technology and it's a piece of technology that could be hacked. Um, should it be? Could it be? How would China react? Fascinating research project. Somebody should look into that. But absolutely, I think that um, anything that you're using cyberspace for is going to open up vulnerabilities. And they've put such an emphasis on that that I think that they have signaled to many that this is, uh, uh, that is right for exploitation. I think on that, I will also point out that you know, when China talks about the fact that it's being hacked, um, it's being hacked by uh, civil society activists that are trying to help people like you know, greatfire.org to get around the Great Firewall. Uh, the US government has, in, has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in an internet freedom initiative that basically are helping people to hack through the Great Firewall. Now, this is a vital national interest to the Chinese Communist Party, and here's the government actually funding, US government funding, hacking tools to go through that. So uh, I think in a sense, um, you know, the Chinese government is absolutely right. It's not just Mr. Snowden, there's all kinds of hacking activity that's sanctioned by the US government, just for those reasons. Look, just a, a final quick word from me uh, as head of the National Security College. I want to, firstly, I want to thank uh, Benjamin Penny and the Centre on China and the World here for this first moment of partnership between uh, these two critical acronyms of, uh, of the ANU, NSC, CIW, ANU. Uh, remember those three. We are looking forward to working together, uh, Ben, on a range of issues, and I think the, the fact that both our centres, uh, I think, were born in the same spirit of um, partnership of university, the policy community, uh, and really international engagement uh, is, is a sign that we should work together, so thank you. I want to especially thank uh, John Lindsay for, I think, a, a very important talk today, a very important presentation, and um, John will be videoing this and it'll be on the, uh, on the internet perhaps not in China, I don't know, we'll see, um, in, in time to come. I think it's a very um, worthwhile talk from an Australian national security policy point of view because a lot of the insights that you've given us into the, the very dynamic nature of um, competition in cyberspace between China and the United States and others suggests that the future is not preordained in uh, security relations. Uh, there's a lot of mutual vulnerability there. there uh, there's a lot of contingency, a lot of dynamism, and I think there is a chance for governments to, uh, to really try and help shape the future. So I think as a, as, as a policy thinker, I find that a most useful set of insights. I think your expertise uh, speaks for itself. I think there'll be a lot of people in this room and elsewhere who'll be going through uh, this talk again and your, and your wider work.
Um, so I want to thank you again for your, your contribution to the National Security College's Cyber Security Week this week, uh, our, our wider conference. We look forward to the continued partnership with you. So thank you, John. Thank you.